All right. Uh, thank you. How are you guys doing? Great. Good. Okay. Well, be said my name. My name. <laughs> Uh, my name is um, Alex Lee. I'm going to be talking to you guys about Darwin and just sort of about history of evolution in general and kind of explain how these three words are all sort of um, related together. Um, just, a, just a little quick bit about myself. I actually got my degree in evolution and ecology from um, UC Davis. Um, docent now at the California Academy of Sciences. If you're there on the third Saturday or um, on, some, sorry, on some Thursday nights, um, I'll be there. And um, I can't emphasize enough how much I love invertebrates <laughs> and, and how much they love me. And by the way, I don't even drink and you could get me to do things like this. <laughs> and, um, and you know, history of evolution, I mean, evolu evolution is no small idea. I mean, we're talking about something that's going back with life about three and a half billion years and has sort of been with us um, since affecting all aspects of life and, you know, creating beautiful things such as um, as these um, colorful um, nudibranchs here, and also creating really hideous things too, since it's almost Halloween. Um, this guy here is a parasitic um, isopod um, now occupying the mouth of this poor fish here. And usually, when we think about the history of, of, of um, evolution, we usually just think about you know Charles Darwin. He went on this you know five-year around-the-world um, voyage, and at some point, he stopped by the Galapagos Islands and found these interesting finches that somehow inspired him to think about evolution. And um, just like to add, uh, this is the delightful, um, oops, delightful um, vampire finch. It actually consumes blood. Yes. Um, but this, this Beagle voyage is really just an incredible scientific voyage. I mean, I absolutely just love the stories from it. And I'm sorry to say, I'm not going to be talking about those stories. <laughs> sorry, I, 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 am, I am a tease in that, in that regard. I, I feel like we talk so much about the Beagle, even though it's such, a great, it's such a great adventure. We talk so much about the Beagle, we just kind of ignore all these other great stories. I mean, I mean, I mean Darwin had a really long life after he returned from the Beagle voyage. You know, what was he, you know, what was he doing then? And also, there was this a lot of people who were talking about evolution even before Darwin, um, believe it or not. So you know who you know who are, you know who are these who are these people? You know there are a lot of great stories about that too. So I'm going to be focus be focusing on, on that and kind of ask these you know two big um, questions: is that um, is that you know who were these people who were thinking about evolution before Darwin, and why were why do we spend so much time talking about Darwin and not these you know other other people, these other transmutation these other transmutationists now. This was before the word evolution was used, so people used the word transmutation. So, uh, I, I just like saying that word just because it sounds hideous. Um, and also, um, the other question is, is that, you know, after Darwin returned from his Beagle voyage, it was for over 20 years before he actually published on the origin of species. And he was is very clear that he was thinking about evolution just really early on. Why was he taking 20 years? I mean, was he sitting on the idea? What was he doing during those 20 years? Yeah, so um, so just kind of back towards just evolution as a kind of a topic again. I mean, evolution is an emergent property of life. It started with life. It's been going on for three and a half billion years. And you would think through the course of human history that people would have noticed something about evolution, something about its consequences, some evidence left behind for it. Even if they necessarily didn't understand, you know, what it was that they were looking at. And as it turned out, when we look at human history, you know, people were noticing signs of evolution. I mean, for, take for example the ancient um, Greeks. They were well aware of fossils for large, extinct um, invertebrates. Um, but the ancient Greeks, being the ancient Greeks, they actually um, creatively reinterpreted these fossils as um, giants that were defeated by the almighty gods. Um, and even Leonardo da Vinci was actually uh, aware of something about uh, uh, evolution. He, he actually knew of, of uh, fossil um, seashells actually found in um, the mountains in Italy, just far away from the ocean. And, and, and Leonardo da Vinci, I mean, he didn't believe in um, superstitious explanations of the universe, but he couldn't, as brilliant as he was, he didn't know how to explain how uh, clams would just suddenly decide to go rock climbing. Um, and then we have this really interesting um, uh, fellow during the Middle East, actually kind of during the golden age of the, of, of, um, the Islamic empires. Um, um, the, the, 
during this period, uh, quite a number of scholars came to this period who were really, really into um, things from ancient Greece. Um, Al Jahiz was, in particular, really interested in Aristotle's writings about biology and just worked on trying to greatly expanding upon that work. And one of his really fascinating um, contr contributions was that you know he very clearly understood that you know all life that is born from seed, birth, eggs, and whatnot, not all those that are born could actually survive. I mean, it sounds obvious to us, but it's not so then. I mean, the reason why this idea is so important is that this is actually one of the pillars of, of natural selection. And you know, Al Jahis lived about a thousand years before Darwin. And then things started getting really interesting and exciting around the, the 18th century when you when um, quite a number of Frenchmen, for some reason, I'm actually not, I'm not so clear on the French history about this, but you could have a lot of French scholars, um, writers from this period who started talking about, discussing how um, species could, it could change, how transmutation could happen. And, uh, but this was kind of kept on the down low, just, I mean, just because talking about those things was heresy. It, it could get you into a lot of trouble, and these people were actually called um, infidels. For uh, for what they believe in, what, and so one one of the interesting infidels that sort of came out of this was uh, Dennis Diderot, who was a uh, encyclopedia writer. He was talk. He also wrote about how um, species was changing over the course of millions of years. Just imagining someone, you know, being in the 18th century, t talking about the Earth as it was millions of years old. You know, it 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 sounds pretty crazy. I mean, it sounded pretty crazy to the police who were also in charge of uh, policing heresy. I mean, they monitored this guy, um, harassed him, and actually jailed him at least once that I've, uh, that I've read. I mean, remember, this is not much more than 100 years after you know, Galileo was talking about his crazy ideas about the universe and how much trouble you know, he got into that. But of all the, er, these early transmutationists, I mean, I think what perhaps probably one of the most important ones is um, Jean uh, Baptiste Lamarck, another Frenchman, um, and, he's, and he comes up with a kind of an interesting mechanism of how this change in species um, could happen in that, um, for example, would take a um, giraffe um, that, uh, that he envisioned that a giraffe a long time ago had a short neck and just trying to reach leaves that were just too high, you, you know, f um, f for it to reach by just using its neck, using its body parts, it could actually stimulate what he called the nervous fluid and this nervous fluid would somehow cause, his, uh, cause their necks to actually grow, I mean, not, uh, to grow within their lifetime. And they would acquire their new traits within their lifetime and then pass it on to their offspring. This is how uh, Lamarck envisioned how evolution would happen. And this view is actually incorrect. However, the reason why Lamarck is actually, I think, is so important is that you know, he, he was, you know, he was a well-known scholar. He was a well-known naturalist. He had other people um, from other parts of Europe, um, England in particular, visiting him, wanting to talk to this famous biology. So he, taught he taught classes in Paris where he had lots and lots of students. He was influencing a lot of, it's a whole new generation of scientists and got them thinking about um, evolution and transmutation and just keep them open to the idea about species, could, how um, these um, species could change. So, um, uh, so, but, um, how I'm um, sorry, sorry, how these species could change. So we had so many transmuta uh, these transmutationists, you know, before Darwin, you know, why do we sort of still talk about Darwin so much and not about, the, what, about these other people? I mean, there's so many of these people, you probably make several Robert Altman films like out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, but, you know, one of the reasons why, which was, uh, uh, which is kind of a very obvious one is that, you know, Darwin had the most robust theory, the most sophisticated and just light years ahead in its accuracy and sophisticated than all the other people before him. I mean, he proposes, you know, his theory of natural selection, um, which much, which, which much more accurately than um, Lamarck, expl uh, you know, explains how species change could happen, that different individuals, some can just survive better than others, and those are the ones that can, um, li live to mate for another day. But another sort of very key thing that Darwin sort of recognized that in order for natural selection to work, you need a lot of variation. Variation today that we call mutations. <laughs> mutations is the fuel of natural selection. Those are the things that natural selection is selecting on. And Darwin recognized that change and variation was not just happening, but it was, had to be extraordinarily common which is something he observed, and it had to be extraordinarily common for, or for it to work. I mean, this is, 
over 100 years before proper genetics came along to help us confirm that. I mean, just, just to just give you guys an idea of how common variation and mutation is, I want um, all of you to look at the person next to you, um, preferably a loved one. Um, the person you're looking at is, is a mutant. <laughs> Every single one of us are born with mutations our parents didn't have. And, and all our children will have mutations that you know, we won't have. I mean, that's how common it was. I mean, most of them are really minor. Most of them actually don't even do anything. But Darwin, you know, over 150 years ago, was able to you know, recognize this. And you know, another actually great innovation that really puts Darwin you know, ahead of his, his other predecessors was he came up with the idea of the evolutionary tree. Now, Lamarck and others came with this idea that an animal, for example, going back to the example of the giraffe, would start with like a short neck. Um, and over time, as you know, time going up, they would you know, become the long neck draft in this, you know, just linear fashion, in this linear fashion. Darwin recognized that species could start as one species, oops, um, down here at the bottom, and over time split into two completely different but related species. So in case for draft, uh, you have the common ancestor, a draft, and the okapi, which is their um, most living um, a modern um, relative now, but they shared an, a common ancestor. So as species continue to branch off and branch off, you get these really complex um, evolutionary um, trees. And, um, and this is actually from a, from a notebook from actually Char that Charles Darwin wrote. Notice at the top, he writes, um, I think, and then he proceeds to draw this um, evolutionary tree um, diagram here. This is the first evolutionary tree diagram ever drawn. And he does this, uh, draws this in you know, 1837. This is less than a year after he returns from the, from the origin of species. I mean, I, I love, love this, this notebook. I mean, this is such a powerful idea that connects us with you know, every single thing that has ever lived and will continue to live on Earth. And, and it's, but it's so understated with, I think. But, um, but you know, less than a year after he comes back from the Beagle Voyage, he's not only thinking about evolution, but having a very sophisticated ideas about evolution. This is, this, is, this is no small matter here. This is a very, he's already thinking about it in very complex, sophisticated ways. So why does it take him, you know, be, coming back from the Beagle Voyage, he draws that diagram, but, you know, it doesn't take him for over 20 years before he gets to the origin of species. What, you know, what was he doing during that time? You know, it's a long time to just sit on the idea, and it's kind of a complicated question. I won't be able to go over all the factors, but I'll just go over just a few, a few of the very, um, very interesting ones. Um, I mean, for one thing, Darwin sort of recognized that you know he just couldn't find one or two examples of evolution. He just couldn't say, you know, just point to finches. He knew that in order to demonstrate something in science, you'd have multiple lines of evidence. You know? So he looked at pigeons. He was looking at mathematics and statistics. He was looking at geology. That was, that was much later, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but grapes. Um, and research actually took a long time. But, not, but compounding this was that shortly after returning from his voyage of the Beagle, he started getting chronically ill. I mean, we're talking about you know, Nausea, vomiting, upset stomach, tiredness, gas. I mean, he had various combinations of all these symptoms, waxing and waiting for the next 40 years. I mean, he was miserable for 40 years of his life. And this, I mean, it, it really affected how he worked. It affected the way he worked. I mean, some days he couldn't even get out of bed. So he had a lot of work to do, but his illness, and it's, his illness is actually still a mystery to us today, although there's quite a number of different hypotheses. I mean, his illness really um, slowed him down. But fortunately for Darwin, there was something else that was um, mutating um, at the time. Um, so this here is what's called the Black Penny. It's the first postage stamp um, ever issued. Um, this came about during, actually during part of the um, Industrial Revolution, where you started to get the expansion of not only railroads, but you also got um, mail that was hitchhiking on that too. It got this enormous expansion of, of rail. So by the middle of the 19th um, century, over 600 million letters were being delivered each year by tens of thousands of mailmen. I mean, you could sometimes expect several deliveries in a single day where 
a mailman will give you a letter. You, he'll wait outside while you read the letter inside and compose a response, and then you just hand the letter back to the mailman. Um, Darwin, and so Darwin, this was something that Darwin took great advantage of at his peak. He was writing about 1,500 letters a year, and he had about 2,000 correspondents around the world. I mean, he spent uh, equivalent about what was then about 20 pounds worth of postage and stationery, which is almost $2,000 today for a single year. I, I mean, and the reason why he was doing, spending so much on postage, because, you know, the, his illness prevented him from traveling much. He sometimes could even travel to London, which was actually a short ways, relatively short ways away to be able to talk to other scientists, pick their brains, get their expertise, their opinions, um, go to meetings and talks, or even visit museums to visit samples. He couldn't even really do that. He was homestricken um, vast, you know, vast majority of the time. So when he couldn't travel, his letters um, did it for him. And in addition to, um, in addition to just, you know, sending and receiving letters, instead of, you know, just not just the power of the word, he was receiving, you know, packages. You know, he would ask for um, seeds, fossil bones, animal hides, you know, the specimens he, wa he wanted to look at to sort of, sort of see if he looked for certain characteristics to support some of his um, ideas that he was, um, he was developing. So, and he, in the mail, actually received lots and lots and lots of barnacles <laughs> in the mail. This was something he specifically requested. So um, why, you know, why was Darwin getting so many barnacles, this, this uh, lowly invertebrate? Well, if you just, we have to step back a little bit about, uh, about this. Actually, up right around this time, Darwin was actually better known as a geologist. I mean, we think of him as this great naturalist biologist. But after, when you look at his research note from The Origin of Species, most of the time he was actually talking about rock formations, layers in rocks on exposed cliffs, um, his sedimentation patterns. And he, Darwin even developed a, actually a really great theory of, actually a correct theory on the formation of archipelagos in the Pacific from based on some of the observations of evidence that he gathered actually on the Beagle voyage. So if you're going to go change biology, I mean, literally, take our understanding of life and just completely rewrite it. You also have to understand life. And Darwin didn't quite have that background. He had incredible amount of skill at this point, but he didn't have quite the naturalist bio, uh, biology background as some of his other peers. So he really essentially needed to develop his um, biology cred. And his entryway into that was actually barnacles. So um, in, uh, in this time, barnacles was considered this really strange and very enigmatic group of invertebrates. I mean, things that people, that um, naturalists thought they knew about barnacles were actually, this discovering at this time were incorrect. People thought that barnacles were, um, uh, thought that they were, um, that, that they were mussels like clams, but, as it, that, but this, they had recently found out during this time period that they're actually um, not, you know, mussels or clams, but were actually um, crustaceans, much like lobsters, even though they look look anything lobster-like at all. And um, another great naturalist, uh, 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 Leonard uh, Jennings, actually, you know, considered that, uh, considering that so, how there's so much history surrounding life and just so much how strange barnacles were, he thought that, you know, an extensive study of barnacles could actually reveal much to our understanding of, of life. Well, little did he know, um, Darwin actually uh, decides to, you know, embark on this um, barnacle study. And he starts with um, this barnacle here. This, guy is actually only a few millimeters big. Um, Darwin um, found him on a, or her, actually on the beach in Chile. He um, named him, or named him uh, Mr. Arthopelanus. Oops. Oops. Um, this is just, uh, just some of the barnacles that Darwin did. This is actually straight from his, um, from his manuscripts that he did um, on barnacles. So you have the um, acorn barnacles. You see, find those very commonly encrusted on rocks. So he, you know, is cataloging all the different um, variations and um, the patternings on their um, on their plates, and of course, you, on their right, you have the st uh, the stock barnacles. Um, Mr. Arthur Belanus actually didn't belong to um, any of these two. It actually belonged to a group known as the boring barnacles, not because they're boring, <laughs> because they actually drill themselves into um, rocks and shells. Actually, Mr. Arthur Belanus was the first bo bo um, boring barnacle um, ever discovered. And just to show you the amazing diversity of um, of barnacles. This was one barnacle that Darwin was not aware of at the time he was doing this research. Um, this is a crab, but if you look inside the crab, you see this network of um, root-like tendrils throughout its entire body. That is a barnacle. <laughs> 
that is a parasitic article. It's it's funny. It's it's I I can't stand horror movies, but I, I really love stuff like this. <laughs> it it's almost Halloween. I have to scare the daylights out of some of you. And one of the and Darwin ends up getting just a number. I mean, more than the Finches. Like I said before, you know. We think of Darwin and think of finches. I mean, I think barnacles were far more even important than the finches in just the, the amounts of insight that he got, you know, about evolution. One of which is homology, and this is kind of one homology that you know we can sort of all relate with. Um, we have the human arm here, skeleton of a human arm, dog leg, um, bird wing, and whale flipper. But notice um, that they all have the exact same sets of bones. Four different animals for different um, purposes, but, you know, but why would you do completely different things with the same bones? Well, it's because we all shared a common ancestor. And we just all happen to inherit, you know, these same sets of bones from our common ancestor, granted with lots of heavy modifications over the past 200 plus million years, but this, but the, this homology, the similarity in these bones, you know, reveals to us our evolution, past evolutionary relationship. And this was something that Darwin got to intimately study with um, barnacles. Um, so in, in barnacles and in their other crustacean relatives, do you have something, do you actually have this forked appendage called the biramus appendage? I um, mean, we're talking about their legs, their antennae, their swimmerettes. Um, this is uh, various examples from several different um, crustaceans, how you get the forks here, right here, and right there. And in barnacles, you know, they don't look like a lobster at all, but if you look at, but if you've ever seen barnacles underwater, you know, they, they have these appendages. They're sticking out and pulling in, sticking out and pulling in, and they're using that, you know, to capture food. And you look at those appendages very closely, they also forked, you know, same homology with, the, with, uh, with all their other crustacean relatives. And this and numerous other characteristics that Darwin, uh, Darwin studied, you know, revealed to him probably far more about evolution than the finches really ever did. And Darwin actually spent eight years working on barnacles. I mean, we're talking, I mean, he spent five years on the Beagle Voyage, one month on the Galapagos, but eight years just working on this one group of, of, of invertebrates. And during that time, you know, he has children and all his children know that daddy ever does when daddy wasn't miserably sick was that, you know, he was, he would work on barnacles and his son, um, Francis, you know, visit a friend's house and actually ask his friend, you know, where does your dad work on his barnacles? Don't all fathers work on barnacles? <laughs> um, but, um, but, um, but I'm sort of going to conclude this, you know, talking about Darwin's family. I already mentioned his son. Um, I can't really do his family justice. I love, just love his family stories. There's so many great stories uh, about it. But, um, but Darwin actually marries his first cousin, um, Emma Wedgwood of, uh, you know, Wedgwood pottery. And remember, this is during the time when it was perfectly fine to go to a family reunion and hit on your cousin. <laughs> this was still very common and very uh, acceptable. Although Darwin actually really secretly thought that there were negative consequences to this. You know, he went and m married his cousin anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and with Emma, they actually fathered a lot of children, 10 children, uh, seven um, survived to adulthood. This was also during the time period where it was not a surprise at all. If you ha were having 10 children, you're gonna expect a few not to make it. I mean, I mean even though people would expe are expecting that to happen, it really hit everyone hard. It really hit um, Dar uh, Charles and Emma really hard every time you know, the, one of their children died, you know, first Mary, then Annie, then, um, then Charles Waring. But, um, but, you know, but, you know, Darwin loved being a husband. He loved being a, being a father. He spent quite a bit of time, you know, with them. You know, he was at home all the time. He was, he was a stay-at-home dad. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he, was, he was home a lot, and he was doing research a lot. So, you know, of course, he was going to, of course, he, like any good scientist, he was going to mix the two together. So I'm just going to end, I'm just going to end, end this. Okay, I did mention that he, he sometimes subjected his parents with experiments. No, he did not harm his children in any way. <laughs> It was more like they were just observational experiments. I'm um, just going to end this with this one uh, experiment that Darwin did. I, it's actually one of my favorite, um, favorite Darwin family research, um, research stories he did very late in his life. Very, very late in his life, you know, he, he was just really fascinated, became really fascinated by earthworms. He was fascinated with lots of things. He got into 
he got into orchids, he got into how plants grew, he got into um, tendril, uh, uh, tendrils on grapes, and you know, he had this really big earthworm period. He wanted to know what earthworms were doing in the soil, how were they behaving, how they were behave, uh, how they were responding to the different stimuli, and one of the stimulus that he was really interested in was sound, because you know he thought he he knew that not all animals could hear. You know he wonder, uh, wondered you know could earthworms hear? How would they respond to sound? So this was the experimental setup that um, that that Darwin had. So um, his wife, oops, his wife Emma was on the piano. Son um, Francis was on the bassoon. His grandson, um, Bernard, was on the whistle. Um, his daughter, Bessie. I could not find a picture of Bessie Darwin. So we have to settle with this. I, uh, so Bessie was just shouting. And you could just, and they were just all collected together in the family's um, drawing room. And you could just imagine this cacophony that they were just racket that, 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 that they were just making because there was this flower pot just right in the center with some dirt and some earthworms. And while, while his family was making all these, all these noises, you know, Darwin was just kind of sitting up right in there in the middle of, you know, his entire, with his entire family, observing, seeing if earthworms could, you know, were doing anything to, with all that sound. And as it turned out, the earthworms didn't care for pianos, bassoons, whistles, or shouting. Um, so it was a negative result in this, exper in this experiment, but it still sounded like they were having a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but, um, but even though the result, it, it is a negative result out of the countless experiments and research that Darwin does, it, it did in his life, I don't think this would really um, affect his reputation too much. Um, but but um, thank you so much. Um, you know, I got into this because eight years ago, I took a class on Darwin, and like a good drunk, I just never stopped reading about him, about his letters or anything. So I have a, some books that, that I would recommend if any one of you are interested in this. I mean, not just Darwin, just any science history stuff. It's just really cool. So um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what finally got Darwin on the graph publishers? Uh, well, partly because he wanted to accumulate all that evidence, but actually one of the triggers, he was actually already starting to work on his book by the late 1850s, but one thing that really sort of kicked him in the ass was a man named um, Alfred um, Russell Wallace. I mean, he was another na naturalist. He was actually in the Ma a Malay archipelago at the time, and they were sort of sending letters back and forth to each other. And Darwin had mentioned you know, to um, um, Wallace that, oh, I'm working on a theory of species change without really saying anything. And Wallace writes back saying, oh, I have this idea too. And he goes ahead and starts describing natural selection. And Darwin, and this sort of freaks Darwin out because you know, Darwin has been working on this for 20 years. So he had already been working on his book on this, but this sort of really sort of kicks his ass and that sort of, he accelerated his book schedule actually. But at the same time, he didn't want Wallace to go unrecognized. So he actually helps arrange for that both him and Wallace will get their papers presented a couple months later at this, at this, at this one um, talk in London. So Wallace would get, end up getting some recognition, although Wallace has been, unfortunately, been forgotten too. All right, uh, yeah, you? So having 10 kids or even seven that survived, gotta be pretty expensive so what was he doing during the generating income during this time that he was flying around in debt? Uh, two things. Inheritance. He had a very wealthy father. Another thing was that his father really ta taught him really well on how to invest in land and in various uh, farms and businesses. So he actually had a very steady um, income without having to leave the house. So, uh, so I mean, this. I mean, this is remember this is in the area of Victorian science where you still had a lot of researchers who were like the gentleman scientists. They were people of a means, so they could support themselves because you know. Science wasn't really much of a paid occupation at this time. Uh, yeah. What are some of the theories of his illness at the Uh There's a couple. The one that I personally favor, and actually, um, these two these two sets of biographers they wrote these two epic epic Harry Potter esque um, <laughs> um, Darwin biographies. <laughs> They're, they're massive volumes and they're fantastic. I mean, I, I mean, I just absorbed them. But anyway, they're, they favor, as long as I as well, that these were um, psychologically stress-induced um, ailments, that he was just very um, prone to anxiety. 
um, because at, because thinking about evolution was believed to have made him really stressful, and his wife was actually really religious and was not fond of his ideas at all. Although his wife was actually like a you know you know they were really good husband and wife to each other. They were very supportive to each other, even though she did not was not fond of his ideas about evolution at all. And I think part of that and part of knowing that after he that when he publishes, he's going to get a lot of um, blowback from people could have caused stress. So that's one of the hypotheses that this was anxiety psychologically induced from um, stress. Uh, another one, which one that I'm not going to favor, but I'm not going to you know, try to bias this too much, is that um, was that we know from his notes that he's probably bitten by an insect known as the kissing bug when he was in South America. And kissing insects um, transmit a disease called, uh, uh, called Chagas disease. So um, some people believe that he was chronically suffering from um, Chagas disease, but the reason why I don't favor that hypothesis too much is that if he had Chagas disease, he would have died a lot sooner, I think, of, of heart failure. Uh, yeah, you in the back? Yeah, so um, David in the back, <laughs> um, he asks what sort of other societal political pressures would have affected him at the time um, when he was starting to publish his ideas. I mean, I think part of, part of the reason why he waited so long was he was really nervous about that, uh, about how people were going to react. But actually, there was one story that I was forced to omit from this talk because it was getting a little long that sort of talks a little bit about that and that um, is that, you know, um, the, the society as a whole was actually somewhat interested actually in this topic by the time Darwin published, in part because there was a man named Robert Chambers who anonymously published a book talking about evolution as well before Darwin, but Robert Chambers, he did this anonymously, he wasn't a scientist, so his science was really sloppy, but he got the public really excited about the scandalous, exciting idea of species change. So the public was already somewhat primed to this at the time, by the time Darwin came along. Uh, sorry, one more question. You, sir. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> uh, can you tell us about Charles Darwin's hunting and eating habits? Hunting and eating habits. Actually, I can't recall off the top of my head about his eating habits, although he did eat something very interesting in South America because um, because in South America, he was he had heard stories from um, local cowboys of because there was this Rhea, basically a relative of the ostrich that was well known there. But there were these local cowboys were telling him these small uh, the smaller species of Rhea, and Darwin really wanted to, to see this Rhea, wanted to shoot, get a specimen uh, uh, of it, and you know sp send those bones back to England for them to examine. And he, he searched far and wide, and he couldn't find it. And his friend Conrad Martins, who was an artist, artist on, on the Beagle Voyage, um, you know, he comes along and, and 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 says like, "Oh, you know, why don't you just have dinner with us? You know, I just, just shot this bird. You know, we'll just make the stew." So Darwin was, you know, in the middle of eating the stew, and then for some reason, at this point, he realized, "Oh my God, this is." this other species of Rhea that I've been looking for. So he asked everybody to tear the bones off the meat that they were eating, and he collected all the bones and all the feathers. No one, didn't, fortunately, didn't roll away feathers and sent it all back. And in terms of, in terms of hunting, Darwin was actually a very, a very good marksman. I mean, um, I mean, he, he, I mean he, he, because his father was really wealthy during an early part of his life, he was a little bit of a playboy in the sense that he kind of didn't care that much what was going on. He went out, hunt a lot. He really honed down his hunting skills quite a bit. Um, so he was very good at shooting birds because this was still a common era where, you know, unlike today, we would more likely to just wait for a bird to die before we collect it for a museum specimen. Back then, the people were still shooting them, and this was one of the things he did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, one more thing. Beagle Voyage, he actually did um, hunt meat for the crew also. So he, w so he was actually quite helpful to the crew. All right. Thank you.